So while you're taking your seats, the format will be pretty similar to the last panel. We have four panelists this time that will each give a short presentation, and then we'll turn it over to all of you for, for question and answer and discussion. I apologize for the mic situation. It's, it's a challenge. It's difficult for us with the vision of Yosemite Falls gushing down the mountainside behind us and the rain pouring down outside the window to recognize that we're in the middle of a drought. But we are. <laughs> we're in the fifth year of drought and we have five years of water deficit to make up. Water scarcity has always been the norm in California. It's only going to get worse as population grows and climate changes. We're already seeing those impacts with reduced snowpack in the Sierra and more rain that we're being blessed with today, which we so desperately need, although it's killing my hiking plans. But groundwater is the best storage that we have, and it's the best buffer we have against future droughts. In the Central Valley, we're seeing as much as two inches of subsidence a month in some places, and that's storage space that in many instances we can't get back. So it's critical that we start recharging the groundwater. And we have four panelists that are going to give us some more in-depth specific examples of what they're doing on the ground to lead the charge, or lead the recharge per se, on this issue. So first we'll hear from Jennifer Clary. <laughs> the panel is ruining me. Jennifer, you are, you're on that. <clears throat> you're on that first. Okay. Uh, Jennifer has a water policy, has, is the water policy and legislative analyst for Clean Water Action. And she directs the Central Valley Program and serves on key state stakeholder committees including the NGO Advisory Committee, which I have the pleasure of serving on with her. And that five extra days for public comment, that's the best news I've heard all week. <laughs> Grant Davis is the General Manager of the Sonoma County Water Agency, and he's responsible for all management activities related to the Water Agency's core functions, including delivery, wastewater management, flood protection, and environmental sustainability. Then we'll hear from Gary Peterson, Gary works for the city, has worked for the city, county, and federal government in various capacities. He's now the director of public works for the city of Salinas and is working with other agencies in the region on their One Water approach and forming their GSA. And then our closer today will be Paul Jones, the general manager of the Eastern Municipal Water District. And he has served in that capacity since July of 2011 and has 12 years. Um, with the district in 26 years of experience in the water industry. So I want to give our panelists as much time as possible, so I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. Thank you very much. Let's see how the microphone treats me. I, as I said, I work for Clean Water Action and Clean Water Fund, which is a national environmental organization that focuses on uh, water issues, which kind of encompasses everything. I'm more of a water quality person. For the past, I guess, two years now, I've coordinated the NGO Groundwater Collaborative. It's a group of about 50 or 60 um, organizations, and we run the gamut. We have small community groups, uh, tribes, local government commission, statewide environmental organizations, and even a few, um, we have a few academics and even a few unions on the, on the group. So basically, we come together to try to understand what's going on on the ground at the local level, what's happening at the state, and how those two should affect each other. And so one sort of quirk of, the, of, the, of Sigma is that stakeholders per se don't have a seat at the table, that you have these local agencies that have water or land use authority, they're the ones who can form a GSA. And that's a step up from the Irwins, where we're, we're basically water authority was the only thing that got you onto a governing body. So I think integrating that land use piece 
is a wonderful thing because land use agencies are, have so much more practice at stakeholder engagement than water agencies do. And I'm really hoping that that helps kind of raise the level of some of these GSAs. So I heard a little bit of uh, 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 concern about stakeholder engagement, but it is really important for this process for a lot of different reasons. One, if you're going to have to have a 218 vote, but also because the, it, it helps the process and because it's required by statute. So we have public participation requirements um, requiring the active involvement of diverse cultural, social, and economic elements of the population. Um, you have um, stakeholder engagement requirements, and stakeholders are described as the beneficial uses and users of groundwater. And that's a really significant group there that it, it, it's really, you're really going to have to focus your outreach on. So the key, as Trevor told you, the key to these uh, groundwater sustainability plans are these undesirable results. You have to manage your basin to avoid undesirable results. And one way you determine undesirable results is by identifying beneficial users and how changes in groundwater impact those users. And then Sigma has a huge list of groundwater, of beneficial users, and some of them water agencies can figure out, and some land use agencies already know, and then some they'll have to figure out together. So what I work with the most are disadvantaged communities, and particularly those who lack safe drinking water. And when you think about, and when you talk about disadvantaged communities, one of the biggest problems is the idea that as long as you take care of most of the problems, the ones that are left over are just ones you'll chip away at over time, or that you'll always have, it's like you'll always have 5% unemployment, you'll always have 2% of people without safe drinking water. So this is from a state report that came out in 2013 identifying communities relying on contaminated groundwater supplies. And it says over 98% of Californians using a public water system <coughs> receive water that meets all state health standards. Well, what's 2% of 36 million? Well, it's 700,000 people. So 2% is a big number in a big state. So I would say that that's kind of a question mark. And who are those people? So when someone said there were too many, too many uh, small agencies in the state, I kind of agree. There's too many water systems in the state. 7,500. And most of them are just little, like little wells out in the middle of nowhere. It could be your local KOA, your favorite restaurant, a roadside um, attraction, having their own, they sink their own well, they have their own water system, they have to comply. But you have 3,000 community water systems that deliver drinking water to residents. 700 of those provide virtually all of the drinking water in use in the state. But you have 2,300 systems with less than 1,000 connections. And about 500 of those have some problem. They don't meet safe drinking water standards, maybe arsenic, nitrate, the new hexavalent chromium, or they simply can't, or they're dry, like, um, like some um, systems in the Central Valley right now. You also have schools, and schools aren't considered community systems because you don't have residents, you don't use them year round, but there's about 400 schools that are on their own water systems. And guess what? When I said 2% of 36 million, I bet a lot of you were saying, but wait a second, the population of the state's 39 million now. Well, there's the part that you don't count. And the state doesn't count the systems that are covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act, and that's anything under 15 connections. And so USGS has an estimate, because no one counts, they estimate that 2.5 million Californians aren't served by a public water system. So if you have five to 14 connections, the county regulates it, as I'm sure you know. One to four connections, some counties regulate it, some just issue a permit. But those systems have less strenuous monitoring requirements than public water systems. And in fact, for private wells, once you sink that well, you're on your own. Um, buy a new house, has a well, you better have it tested because the state, the county has no authority or they have authority, but they choose not to exercise authority over that well. So what do you do about those people? Well, what I would say is it's time for us to not count what we don't want to know because it doesn't really help the situation get any better. And so one thing that the state passed, the legislature passed in 2011, is the human right to water. And I wasn't a big fan of this 
when it first started because I thought, oh, it's just this statement, it doesn't do all that much. But you know, um, the community members, the impact of community members that worked on this was really, really important to them. That the state recognized that, that having safe and affordable drinking water is really a basic right. And we're not talking about providing free water to people. You know, if you don't have safe drinking water, you're paying twice for water, once for water you can't drink, and again for bottled water. Or let's say you get your, wa your water supply fixed, like San Gerardo near Salinas. They got a new well dug with, with the state uh, bond money, but the well had to be two miles away to find a safe drinking water, and even then it still had, had to be treated for a DBCP. And they pay $120 a month for your, their water. So let's just say that when people talk about how to get people engaged in water, this is not the way you want people to get engaged in water, but the most engaged people, and the people most willing to pay the price for water, are the people who don't have it. And those are the people that I want to be sure are engaged in this process. So as part of participating in the, in the stakeholder groups with the Department of Water Resources and talking to some of the other um, local agencies that are trying to figure out how to form a GSA and understand what this beneficial user requirement means, um, some of us said, well, maybe we need to provide a guidebook. So Clean Water Fund, which is my C3 arm, Community Water Center, which is a water justice group based in Visalia, and the Union of Concerned Scientists collaborated on a book, on a, on a white paper, just trying to provide some guidance and case studies on how you might want to do public engagement for groundwater sustainability. And just really a few basic overviews. One, benefits of stakeholder engagement, improved outcomes, you optimize resources, reduce conflict. And I think that a good example of that is the Sacramento Water Forum. Everyone, I think most of you might know about it now. It came out of uh, successful um, litigation over American River flows. And they formed the Water Forum. It has basically four um, pillars. So you have water agencies, environmentalists, business interests, and somebody else. Um, and in order to do something, 75% three of the four pillars have to vote for it. And they still managed to operate very successfully. They've actually created two groundwater plans, and they're still working on flow requirements. But they're moving forward, and they're not fighting. So that, it's a really good example that I hope some of the GSAs can follow. So a little roadmap for stakeholder engagement, just some really basic ideas, stakeholder identification and analysis, outreach and communication, data collection and information sharing, decision making and adaptive management, just to use some short examples. I know that that, uh, that Brad is going to talk about Sonoma County, so I'll just say that the stakeholders in Sonoma County are pretty happy with what they're doing. Not totally happy because frankly, we're all a little disgruntled and frustrated and apprehensive about Sigma. And I think that we all need to accept that and move on. But Sonoma County is doing a pretty good job with their um, basin, with their basin plans and their outreach. And they're particularly focusing on trying to understand and interview stakeholders. And I think the stakeholders appreciate that. I don't want to forget that tribes are part of this process. Now tribes get their rights from the federal government. So they get to choose whether or not they engage in GSAs. But I really urge you to, to do that engagement, to reach out to tribes and try to work with them to, to figure out how you can work together in a basin. And the North Coast, Irwin, did a really good job. Actually, they didn't do a good job, but then communities came in and they did. So they created their first Irwin without a lot of tribal engagement. So what? So a nonprofit, the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water, actually hired an outreach coordinator who visited all the tribes and got them to, most of them to sign a resolution to the Irwin asking for representation. And the Irwin said, yeah, we can give you two seats, and you guys have to figure out how to use it. And they had something like 38 tribes. And so they created a sharing arrangement whereby they get two seats on the Irwin and they go back and share the information with all the other tribes. So it's been pretty successful. I just want to say when it comes to information sharing, the example of Ventura County, which has meters on every well that's not a de minimis well, and has some other requirements in the groundwater ordinance is a really good idea. Remember that information is power, that once you know how much water, you have to know how much water people are 
using before you can decide how to regulate it. Stanislaus County, boy, they can learn the hard way, you know, all the rangeland and the foothills that's been converted to permanent crops. I'm not using grapes because you could put grapes everywhere, but I started get almonds instead. But they started seeing problems, so conflicts between farmers. And that actually is what spurred development of their water advisory committee. And while I wish they had like one woman on it, um, it would be <laughs> still the fact that they do it. They have public meetings around the county. And I think, and they're really making a strong effort. They passed a water ordinance and they're considering a stronger one. And I think that they're really moving forward. And what I want to just say is, no one expects perfection, that we all know that we're going to fall on our face. And, the, and the, when you're talking about public engagement, we all want to do it together. So if you, if you engage people in the process, they'll be more forgiving of your errors. And it's just when it comes to adaptive management, I'm sorry, it's too early to find a new GSA that has successfully done its adaptive management. And I hope it doesn't take a century for you, but Santa Clara Valley Water District was formed I think in 1910, around groundwater subsidence, and it took until like 1970 to come into you know balance. But they actually do a very good job. They were really strong environmental environmental um, arm. They are accommodating changes in land use. They have their advanced treated recycled water plan. So just to say, look at them as the future, and say someday I'm going to be them. And remember, if you have a lot of ag now, maybe that won't be the general future. And so our, we just have a lot of best practices, and I'm happy to say that the first best practice to develop a communication plan is currently is a requirement in the draft SIGMA regulations. And so we're hoping that stays in the final regulations. And that way you say, how do we talk to the public, communicate to the public, identify the public, and then go around and do it again? And putting that in one place, I think, is really important. Give stakeholders a role in decision making and engage the public on their terms. And don't hold your meetings at 10 o'clock on a weekday morning. Just don't do that. And renew your efforts. It never stops. You have to do it over and over again. Thank you very much. Thank you provided the segue for me into our next speaker's presentation, Grant Davis, in referencing the great work that they're doing in Sonoma County. So I'll hand it over to Grant. Good morning. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here uh, on the 25th anniversary of this, I guess, group. Um, I've wanted to come in years past, and my schedule hasn't worked out, so this year it happened to be the case. And I can't tell you how nice it was to walk out of the lodge this morning and look up and see the, uh, the falls coming over there. Just a beautiful sight. We can't see it anymore, so hopefully you had a chance to do it this morning. But uh, it, I just want to reflect a little bit. Jennifer did such a great job of Clean Water Action. She's been working on these issues for years, and I'm glad that you're on our panel. I'm looking forward to hearing what Gary and Paul as the closer is going to do. So hopefully we will give you some framework on the local level of what's happening. And I, I, right out of the gate, just want to say, with full disclosure, we're not as far along as people think we are. <laughs> that is something that I really want to emphasize. This is tough stuff. This is not easy. When you're linking land use and water supply, if it was easy, it would have been done years ago. But I will say, from my perspective, the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was, in fact, probably the most important piece of legislation that's happened in the last 100 years. And it's something that is very likely to continue. I don't see us being able to do it ever again. It was referenced earlier by Elizabeth that um, the drought is what preceded that. It was Prop 1 being formed, uh, the, the whole the bond to get $7.5 uh, billion dollars out on the streets to create projects, and simultaneously, SIGMA came right in behind that. And I think as we evolved ourselves on groundwater management plan, there's a lot of reasons it happened, and a lot of people to give credit for, but the fact is, it was passed and signed by the governor, and it's going to drive us. So I want to jump right into that. Can't help but at least set the, the stage. Jake McKenzie, your August chair of your board, was the board member that was on our water advisory committee. He chaired it for several years. Should imagine that tremendous leadership there, uh, working for the Sonoma County Water Agency, for Royal Park, engaged on water, groundwater, and a number of other things. So I want to publicly thank you for those years of service.
Jake, as we all know, is not bashful. So he also was the chair for many years of the North Coast Resource Partnership that Jennifer just referenced. And in fact, one of our proudest moments was having tribal participation in an integrated water management plan and becoming the number one ranked program in the state of California, the North Coast. So again, under Jake's leadership and many others, um, so I just, it's that type of engagement that one person can make such a difference, it's just phenomenal. And uh, along those same lines, if you let me, Judy, uh, forming this organization and going back through memory lane, we were just doing this at PCL two weeks ago on the same topic, and you're still at it, and you're as relevant as ever, and thank you. Coming behind that, you were wise enough to find the next person to take your leadership, Rain and Kate, and I am telling you, LGC, you are well represented with leadership at the staff level, Kate, on so many issues statewide, knocks it out of the park. And we're working on, on countless areas where we are working with LGC as the fulcrum, the center point. She knows when to engage and when not and how to build collaboration. So I just want to make sure that's understood because when you stand up and take credit for where we are in a process that's nowhere near where it needs to be, that's the context. And last, before jumping in, I have to acknowledge that Susan Gorin is my boss, the director of the Water NC. One of the reasons we're able to do as much as we have is she also has a hat as the director, as the supervisor of the Sonoma County. We're integrated already by virtue of the fact that our water district managers are also supervisors from the County of Sonoma. It gives us a tremendous advantage to integrate, to get ahead on climate change, to think about energy, land use, water supply, and health care. So those are sort of the framings that I, I felt very much I wanted to, to lead off with this morning. But I can't help but also say by being out in the break, seeing that potential groundwater supply falling from the sky <laughs> just warmed my heart. <laughs> that fall was not fall. The last time I was here, it was dry. And so that's a good sign. Our reservoirs, as Susan and I were talking this morning, I'm looking at activating my EOC right now and our DOC to respond to flooding. The Russian River might crest 32, 34 feet on Saturday morning. So you can bet I'll be going back there and dealing with a different set of circumstances. So with that, I'm going to move through this, and as I get into that description, just want to quickly acknowledge Lori Gallian, Susan Hayden, and Corey, Terry Pollard. They're, uh, Lori's the vice chair now of our water advisory committee. These are elected officials out of the city of Sonoma, and going to be doing some great work to help us do this work. And Carrie and Susan are staff, so the fact that I have staff here, and I'm not going to be here for the whole conference, you'll be able to engage, and I just want to thank you for being willing to come down from Sonoma and be a part of this. So here we go. Forgive me if it sounds like I'm bragging, because again, the take-home message is we're nowhere near what we need to be. When Trevor said uh, this is what DWR is looking at, and when Elizabeth talked about this, uh, and Judy, it's complex stuff, and there really is not a roadmap. And I do not want to end up in a situation that we're forced to do this by adjudication or having the State Water Resource Control Board tell us how to do it. Nevertheless, what you heard Trevor say is, we're the state and we're here to help. We're going to give you the authority to go impose fees on people who have never had them imposed on them before. That's going to be a great one. I can't wait to do that. <laughs> and more importantly, we're going to make sure you have the proper regulatory, regulatory authority to go do it. So, yeah, that's just big stuff. This is a big deal. And as Elizabeth said, it's the framework that is going to guide water supply and give you basically the beginning of what you're looking for in terms of integrating the land use and the water and making sure the planning and the governance structure, that's what I'm about, the governance to make sure these decisions get made. That's what we all have to get right. And it's going to be different in different regions. So that's another aspect of it. There are, you hear Kern County saying, I hope this goes away. And the Tulare Basin, they hope it goes away. Well, if you're betting, why would that happen? Uh, maybe there's some tremendous political opposition I'm not yet aware of. My prediction is it's here to stay, and it'd be better to take advantage of LDC's position and learn how to get out ahead of it and what elements of stakeholders have to be at the table. And I'll tell you, the state has to stay engaged. Susan Gordon asked a question earlier, do you, Trevor, and it's help. We need to know who's eligible. That is a moving target. And I can tell you right now, when the ad community wants to have 17 seats at the table and the environmental community and the environmental justice community want to come in, how big a table are we going to have? So these are fundamental questions. I'm hoping Paul's going to answer them when I'm done. <laughs> So, very briefly, I've taken a lot of my time, so I'm tailoring what my staff gave me, and I'm just going to say, we've got a lot of wonderful folks that we serve water to. We're about 40 miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge, 600,000 water customers. These are the communities that we serve that water to, under the direction of the people I just mentioned. We have 
solemn obligation to manage that resource, which is the Russian River and the stewardship. The steward for that resource is what provides our water supply. We have a series of large rainy collectors, this being one example up in the far right. They're basically taking water that's filtered through the Russian River system, these wonderful gravels that make it pure quality water that we then put into the spreading basins and then into the supplies that uh, are then shipped south in our water transmission system to communities south. So here's what's happening in Sonoma County, if you'll bear with me. First thing we did was a stakeholder assessment that was conducted. This is building on years of work. We were about a decade ago. We started in the Sonoma Valley. Actually, it was the Alexander Valley. We were able to do uh, studies and found that uh, there was not an overdraft at that point and moved successfully into different basins. So we have now formed a basin advisory panel that's providing input. This is essentially the, uh, the county and the cities of jurisdiction that think that they're eligible or, or specifically eligible have been meeting now for years uh, trying to get this up off the ground. Uh, we formed a uh, uh, GSA uh, working group of, of already eligible entities that have been coming up with potential governance structures. Uh, something that's not clearly pointed out on here is the fact that we hired uh, a woman named Gina Bartlett. I want you to remember that name because I think my buddy Gary is going to mention it as well. There's a commonality there. You've got to get facilitation services. And that's something that DWR responded well to us, requesting facilitation funds to help local communities that are about to impose new fees on people who have never had them collected before. These are rural residentials and, and private landowners that are on groundwater. That's the big issue. So facilitation is a must. And DWR has to keep cranking out dollars to make sure that facilitation happens. It doesn't have to be Gina, although she is the best. Somebody that she's trained or has a similar skill sets to make stakeholder involvement. Uh, Jen, thank you so much, Jennifer, for the throwaway saying that we're doing a good job. The first step is to ask the questions and figure out where people stand so you can determine how to govern. So we have done uh, this much work here, a lot of public workshops to get to this point. I will say we've even gotten an ad hoc so that Susan Gorin and uh, Colleen of hers, Director David Rabbit, are meeting to guide staff into this process. Very briefly, these are the groundwater basins that we're targeting. We actually have 14 of them. And we're, we're three of them are actually in high priority right now. That's the Santa Rosa Plain, the Sonoma Valley, which we've been working on since 2006. We completed a, a study then on a voluntary basin one plan, right? So we were in a voluntary mode until the Sigma hit. And that's going to be a big dance for us to have to move off of that. So three basins, high priority. The first key in this is that you need to get the USGS give you accurate scientific data to know exactly what's happening in your basins. That's the second one beside facilitation. Get the science to make sure you know exactly what your, what your groundwater basins are. Another thing that DWR did is they used the Bolton 180, 118 guidelines. Those don't always overlap the hydrologic region and the, uh, the uh, groundwater basin per se. So we have some areas that are going to be left out and we did not have the time to, to rectify that, but those areas that are shaded there uh, outside the 118 areas are going to have to be incorporated. Some people are going to be pretty happy or unhappy depending on how we go. You heard about this earlier, so I'm going to rip right through it and just say, as Trevor said, this is what you got to do. By 2017, you got to step up a, a groundwater sustainability agency. In our case, we're going to have three of them because I'll bet you Sonoma will not abrogate their land use responsibilities to Santa Rosa, and Santa Rosa has no business putting into Petaluma's land use. So you can see that's the scale we're at. But we are looking to create an overarching entity that can probably help coordinate grants management and funding and whatnot. But it remains to be seen if we'll do it, particularly by 2017. We got to develop a groundwater sustainability plan by 2022. And then the big lag, you saw some of those. We got to get something by 2040, 2042. We'll get there. My own presence is if we can get this thing up and running, we can't wait in our area until 2040, 2042. It's going to have to be earlier to get the governance right the land use and water supply issues will follow. So to wrap up, I just want to talk about the ongoing challenges. Um, we are strong supporters of Sigma. Uh, we've got to make sure all groundwater users are fairly represented, and that's the challenge. We've got to make sure that the interests are represented in a fair and equitable way. It's complicated. I'm just going to say it again. If this were easy, it would have been done years ago. This is some serious stuff, and we need help. One of the folks I rely on is our own Bob Wilkinson back there. There's the Iwani principles, but Bob has been helping us frame how we work as a county and beyond the county statewide and even beyond that. So Bob, thank you for your many years of service and help with us on this. 
I think in some ways we wouldn't be as far along without you. And then uh, here's the wrap up. Draft regulations for groundwater sustainability plans, they do provide insights into the complexity of the law. And what you're all about today, I think I'm going to segue into, is how do you link that land use and, uh, and water interest. And what we did, again, because we are integrated already, remember we have the County of Sonoma represented by five people, who are also the directors of the water agency represented by five people. We hired the former director of our permanent and resource management entity. So the person that did land use for the county that retired, we enticed him back by saying, do we have a project for you? How about speaking the same language with water and learning that? So we a guy named Pete Parkinson. I would say Pete Parkinson, who's probably been here in years past, is a uh, very helpful entity who, who's bilingual, maybe trilingual, because my take home is, Water managers speak one language, and you'll find we don't speak land use. I'll tell you what, and I don't want to speak land use. I can tell you that right now. I need somebody else that can, and I will gladly work with somebody that can bridge this. It's too much for me to promise you to deliver water, make sure we have sustainable groundwater, and speak two languages. I just am not good at it. So let's find the people who are. Pete Parkinson is one of those. Gina Bartlett's another one. And I believe that is my last statement. So thank you for letting me be here. are making all my transitions so easy for me today. Uh, Grant and Gary will share the same facilitator apparently for their GSA formation. So let's hear more about what you're doing down in Salinas. Okay. So uh, I also am uh, very happy to be here. I happened to be in Sacramento earlier this year uh, with my uh, city manager, Ray Corpus, and we met with Kate, and I started talking about water, and she said, we need to come to a conference, and then she connected me to Danielle, and I described to Danielle that uh, um, in my office, I'm known as being on fire about water, and so I started talking to her, and she said, you are on fire about water. So I am here, this is the city of Salinas, this is the uh, largest city between San Jose and Oxnard. We're 20 miles inland from the Monterey Bay, 155,000, uh, 22 square miles, an island in an ocean of lettuce. We grow about 80% of the table lettuce in this country uh, in any given year. Um, it's an interesting place. We also have the only MS4 permit in the entire Central Coast region, which is uh, that permit is sometimes uh, my biggest uh, uh, all sorts of things. So uh, um, Salinas is uh, often um, sort of set back in the realm of Monterey County and taken a back seat to politics. However, with the largest uh, amount of uh, uh, the largest economy, the uh, largest population, and a new city manager about four years in now, we've uh, uh, begun to assert ourselves in different ways. Uh, so, uh, one of the ways that we're going forward and where we're banking our future is on the uh, concept of agricultural technology. The idea of marrying Silicon Valley with um, Salinas Valley. And uh, last year, Forbes magazine brought their Future of Food conference right down into a tent on our main street in the heart of Salinas to talk about the nexus of waste, water, and energy, and where we are going with technology as we move towards 10 million people and who are going to feed them. Uh, and it was a fabulous conference, and we're uh, looking at a lot of educational programs and a lot of ways of thinking about that, but it's built on the pillars of water, waste, and energy. I created in my public works department this year a new division of water, waste, and energy, where we have all of these projects working. A lot of energy conservation projects, uh, solar, uh, we're doing a lot of innovative things with waste, but water, we've got some problems with water. Uh, drought has been very serious for us. Um, it's been very serious for all of us, and, and dealing with that, and we've had a lot of farmers running out of water. Um, it's interesting in the Salinas area. Uh, we, although we do suffer from subsidence, uh, when we pull the water out of the ground, we have plenty of water to come in and fill it up. The problem is that it's seawater. So this is a map that actually shows. 
uh, from up in the dark green in 1944 when I started working on it, and how it's progressed right down into 2011 out on the edges. And last year we lost a major drinking water well to saltwater intrusion. So um, our growers, farmers, have, are smart guys. And I would say one thing that I've learned in working with these folks is it's always going to be, we're supposed to, you know, private sector, part, uh, public sector, they're bottom line people. They are absolutely the bottom line. And when you have conversations with them, that's what they care about. So uh, they worked uh, several years ago with the Monterey Regional Water Pollution Control Agency to develop the largest agricultural uh, recharge recycle project uh, in the world. Uh, up near Castroville, uh, they've taken all of the affluent from the Monterey Peninsula, uh, processed it now since the late 90s to a tertiary level, purple pipe level of irrigation, and pumped it out to where you see all the artichoke fields when you come to Monterey. Because everybody that goes to conferences sooner or later comes to Monterey. So you, you drive through the artichoke fields in, in Castroville. Uh, so, uh, great project. Uh, but this plant was built back in the 80s, and that project was built in the 90s where everybody believed that development would go on forever. And it was a trajectory, a straight line of land use and development and housing. So the farmers and the growers built this plant based on access to 19,500 acre feet of treated affluent. And it's really fascinating, this plant peaked uh, about four years ago at 15,500 in affluent inflow, now it's going backwards. And we're down below 11 and dropping towards 10. Uh, it's really interesting to me because people haven't decreased, uh, but what's decreased is uh, all of our conservation efforts, our improvements early in our city to pipelines and sewer lines. Uh, and low flow toilets and uh, all of these things have started to have an impact. So the farmers are sitting out there saying, where's our 19,500 acre feet? And the first meeting I went to, they were pounding on the table about they wanted that water. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, but it doesn't exist. Well, it didn't matter to them. They paid for it, they wanted it. And that's where the conversation started. <laughs> One of the things I think we need to do is get different lenses. We need to think about things differently. When I look at energy, I look at waste. We treat so many things as a liability that have the potential to be assets. Certainly wastewater, stormwater fall into those areas, and we need to begin to rethink that. Uh, it's also, I was thinking of Mr. Gardino last night in all of his, uh, his conversation, I enjoyed very much, but there's some, I have my own P words here for you. And, 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 and sometimes it needs to be personal. <laughs> Uh, this is my grandfather's water. My grandfather uh, lived in India and down the Imperial Valley. This is the All-American Canal, and he was a framing carpenter. One of the things he did was he would go out and extend this canal and work on it, pour, build the forms, crews would pour concrete in there, build houses all over Cathedral Valley, Palm Desert, all those places. And he would take us out in his old, uh, old 50, uh, old, a 55 Olds Rocket 88 with the portholes in the side, pile seven grandkids in there, drive through the desert, and show us the water and talk about bringing paradise to the desert. You know, we, would, uh, we would grow crops, we would build houses, we would create paradise. This is my father's water. This is called the Colton Plunge, Colton out between San Bernardino Riverside where I grew up. This was a warm water artesian pool that was 100 meters long, 25 meters, 50 meters wide. I literally, my father worked for the city and managed this. I grew up in this pool. I swam for the first time when I was six weeks old and the last time when I was 16, uh, every summer. But it was fed from a well from another city. So every day at the end of work, when you went back home with your dad, you'd go over to San Bernardino and shut off the valve that filled us. My father was a water guy. He swam, he coached, he taught all of that. Water was much more of a recreational pursuit for him, but definitely something that mattered a lot. This is my water. This is the Salinas Pond. One of the things that our growers, smart people that they are, figured out how to do with all that medicine group was to take it, chop it up, put it in bags, and sell it to all of you as bag salad. One of the great innovations of our modern life. Uh, but they also produce about 3,500 acre feet of wastewater a year. This is the Salinas River right next to it. Uh, the water goes to these ponds, it's aerated, put in for evaporation. Uh, worked for a long time, it was built on a system that was built in World War II to process dehydrated fruit for the war effort. We recently put $8 million in new pipelines and new upgrades. 
and started to look at this facility in a very different way. In fact, what I found out one day was that everybody wanted my water. <laughs> and instead of the guy with the hair, uh, we're the ones with water. And the people, uh, somebody gave me a PowerPoint presentation where someone had been over on the Monterey Peninsula uh, giving a presentation about how they were going to take our water and recycle and use it for drinking water. <coughs> We're like, wait a minute, shouldn't they be talking to us? So we began conversations. We began to think about what should we be doing? Should we be doing something different with this water? As things began to change, and, and we knew the growers were out there wanting more water. Trout was here. So what should we do? Well, this is the this is uh, Monterey Peninsula. Uh, it's a 2.1 to 2.5 billion dollar tourism industry. Uh, all of you go there, it's beautiful. My father would have got this, the recreational piece, the wonder, the splendor, the doll. All, all of that sort of thing. Uh, all of that sort of thing. So uh, this is the Salinas Valley. Agriculture, uh, somewhere between four and eight billion, depending on which economist you listen to. Uh, you know, that, this is my grandfather's side, that would have under, he would have understood this, the wealth that we go with that. And in the middle of it, Runs about so 2.1 billion on this side, 4.3 billion on this side, and these are worlds that do not speak to each other. These are worlds that have never worked together. In the middle of it, the RTP is the Pollution Control Agency, CSIP at the top of the Castro Bell. The problem with the peninsula is the Carmel River, their seaside aquifer is under adjudication, been uh, managed by the courts since 2000. The Carmel River, which was their other primary source of drinking water, is under a cease and desist permit so that we could uh, protect steelhead trout. By 2017, they'll lose one third of that water. By 2020, they'll lose one half of that water and their potable water. They're looking at desal. Uh, I'm getting wait and see on desal. We'll see where that goes. But in between, we figured out that we could take, look at our pond water and think about how to use that differently. Um, and what we also figured out in Salina is, uh, as all the farmers were pounding the table, saying we do not talk to people on the peninsula, that uh, uh, no drop of water will ever leave the Salinas Valley, that we had 2,000 jobs a day from the city of Salinas in the hospitality industry. And that would be a devastating blow if we did any damage at all to that, uh, to that <laughs> industry. So it comes down to trust. It comes down to who do you trust? So we started these conversations with the peninsula about getting them water, possibility of advanced water treatment, uh, providing more water for the, uh, for the growers, for recycling, I started thinking about this. And at one point, I interviewed everyone to see who they trusted, to see who they believed, so that when we had these conversations, people could advance the topic. So this is one of my most important slides from a book by a guy, <laughs> Sam Painter, uh, wrote a great book, Participatory Decision Making. That's your civil war in the middle. It is not a civil war, it's what happens when we try and do new things. And we work past the process that business as usual, and we start exploring differences. And you're gonna take a ride to that growth zone every time you try and do something different. There are ways through it. You can talk through it, you find mutual benefit, you understand other people's needs. But the other P is perseverance, the other P is process. The right process, the facilitator process. Gene and Barbara's fabulous. We are going forward with our GSA. First meeting, we had 125 stakeholders. So it's going to be a while, right? But we are going through the grown zone, and you will go through it too. But you can understand that and understand that it's painful and difficult. What we did in the middle of it, trying to figure out how we could advance this. Got a lot of smart people that work for me, took a $750 bladder, stuck it in the line, the transfer lines for our wastewater to the ponds, to burn it to sanitary sewer. And over two years, we provided a million gallons of water for recycling that was never available, right in the heart of the job. If you want to talk about building trust, we suddenly took the bold action it changed everything. And this was a keystone action. I say a keystone action in the sense that it then opened up the idea that we could take storm water and that we could take a reclamation ditch and we could take agricultural tailwater. And we're now completing a project called Pure Water Monterey, which will provide 10,000 acre feet of new recycled water for advanced water treatment for the peninsula and further irrigation to expand the sea sip to combat saltwater intrusion. And these are our ponds right now. 
And they're empty. And we're now looking at the, uh, converting them for storage because we can put about 2,500 acre feet of storm water in them and have it available in the summer. All of this just in time for, for groundwater sustainability. One thing I can tell you about this picture is nobody in the Salinas Valley is in that picture. <laughs> I can promise you that. Uh, but what we found, and this is really important, and this is what I want you to think about, the grown zone and collaborative processes. The, the alleged Mark Twain quote that waters for, whiskey's for drinking and water for fighting over. Um, he didn't really say that, but he should have. Um, you can fight about water. In fact, we've fought about water all of our lives, up five generations Westerner. And what do you get from that? You get fight, you get enemies. In a collaborative process, when you work together like we did with Pure Water Monterey, when this popped up, and my ad commissioner said, we've got to get everybody to the table. That's a change. You build relationships to advance into other problem solving. You could move forward because you built relationships, not created enemies. We absolutely have to keep that in mind as we go forward. We've got a lot of daunting issues facing us. It's one of my, I love this place, the Pogus Water Temple. It's the terminus of the Hetch Hetchy project in San Mateo County where the water enters into Crystal Springs Reservoir. And I really like this because we went in this beautiful natural environment and built this thing. Well, that's what we did all over this planet. This is my grandfather's vision, my father's vision. We were very successful with the LA Project, Hoover Dam. We've grown, sprawled, we've built all these wonderful things. And now we reap the harvest and address the consequences. And how are we going to do that? What are the tools, what are the mechanisms, what are the conversations, what are the processes we need to go forward? The stakes are high. My final key word is prevail, because we must prevail on all of these issues, we're going to have something left because what do our children inherit from us? So that's what we have to do and we need to go forward and figure out how to do these things together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary, so much for that very personal account of what's happening in the Salinas Valley and how you guys are addressing the issues that everyone in the state is facing now. And last but not least, we have Paul Jones with us. And in the Eastern Municipal Water District, they're also doing water recycling for groundwater recharge. And you can tell us more about that. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I am Paul Jones. I'm general manager of Eastern Municipal Water District, uh, located in western Riverside County. I don't know quite how that naming convention works. <laughs> we're going to talk to you a little bit today about Eastern, give you a little background and context of what we're doing as an organization, our water supply portfolio, kind of the challenges that we have. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about indirect portable reuse as a succession plan for what we have, which is a very successful water recycling program, and how we're looking at that as a future water supply and also as a method to sustain our groundwater basins in our service area. Then I want to talk a little bit more globally. What is the potential for water recycling, particularly indirect portable reuse, uh, on a statewide basis and some summary conclusions? So, starting out, Eastern Municipal Water District, we were formed in 1950. We have about a 500 square mile area in western Riverside County, uh, 768,000 population. We're a regional special district. We serve seven uh, cities in a substantial area of unincorporated county, both developed and undeveloped areas. Um, and we have a five member publicly elected board. Uh, I'm one of those uh, water people. There's so many water agencies. We're one of those water agencies. Uh, we are also one of 26 member agencies of the Metropolitan Water District, Southern California. In fact, we were formed uh, to bring imported water in from Metropolitan in 1950. We are a very arid, very high growth area. During the peak of the building boom in 2008, we were adding 16,500 equivalent dwelling units a year. Uh, it's a tremendous growth area. It's affordable housing. Uh, and we coordinate very closely with the local land use agencies to make sure that we have sufficient water supplies to serve that growth both now and the future. Uh, currently, the pace of growth is about 3,000 dwelling units per year. Uh, the other side of the coin is we're in a very arid area. 
Uh, average year, 11 to 12 inches of rain. Uh, last year, we had four inches of rain in our service area. So we are challenged with local water supplies. But as you'll see, we are very innovative in our ability to uh, come up with local supplies as needed. So we have the following services, potable drinking water. Uh, we serve uh, wholesale and resale, uh, retail. We also do wastewater collections and treatment throughout the service area, both uh, for the wholesale agencies that we wholesale to, as well as our retail operation. And then from that wastewater collection and treatment, we develop recycled water. We have a world-class recycled water system that we've invested in tremendously. And what we're looking at, what I'm going to talk about, is where that system goes in the future and how it's going to meet our demands. And also, we have a very, uh, and make substantial investments in water use efficiency. We have some of the most strictest land use standards in the state uh, for landscaping. Uh, we've coordinated with the County of Riverside and re-adopted their uh, landscape ordinance. Essentially, for all new development, we disallow non-functional turf of any kind. It's all required drought tolerant landscaping and climate appropriate landscaping. Uh, we have removed uh, over 4 million square feet of turf in our service area in the last two years. We have a budget-based rate system that rewards conservation. And as a result, the last decade, we've seen a 45% drop in per capita water use. So that's part of our water supply planning and portfolio. Um, when you look at our sources of supply, about half of our water is imported water. Most of that is from the Colorado River. We purchased that through the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. About, uh, 12, about 12 to 15 percent of our water is imported water uh, from the Delta uh, through the State Water Project System. And then the lower right portion of that uh, pie is our other sources of supply. Uh, I'll talk about those individually. Our well water is about 12 percent. We have one groundwater basin that has the highest quality water that the majority of production is done from. We also do desalination. I want to say here first, there's several flavors of desalination. This is not ocean desalination. This is brackish groundwater desalination to remove contaminants, which is highly desirable in our service area for a number of reasons, and I'll talk about that. And then a third of our water supply is recycled water. Uh, so we recycle, we do not waste water, we do not discharge water, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So if you look at it kind of globally, where we get that water, uh, obviously as I mentioned, we are a member of the Metropolitan Water District, Southern California. They get water from the State Water Project and the Colorado River Aqueduct. But what I'm going to talk about today in this presentation is focused on two things, uh, or on, on the lower left, and that's our local supplies of water, because that's our future. When we look at growth in our service area, that growth is going to come from development of those local supplies and further investment in very substantial investments that we've made already. So our management of our groundwater basins is paramount, and that's not only from a supply standpoint, but from a water quality standpoint. Um, also, brackish desalination is a key component. Uh, recycled water and continuing our succession plan for our recycled water program into indirect potable reuse and then stormwater capture. So what's the problem with imported water? This, map show, uh, this graph shows the problem with imported water. We are reliant on imported water, but it is less reliable in, in the future. Metropolitan Water District does a great job of modulating these variations in supply through its storage programs and, and has kept that uh, supply available through, imported water supply available through Colorado River. But our state water project allocations have been low historically. They will continue to be variable in the future. Uh, and the state water project is our, of our imported water supplies is our lowest, has our lowest salt uh, and has the lowest salt content. And that's really shown on this. So when we look at importing water into the service area, the best supply of water that we have is the state water project water. Uh, this graph shows the salt content. Just to put this in perspective, for each acre foot of water that comes into the service area from the Colorado River, it can have up to 1,900 pounds of salt, almost a ton of salt. So to the extent we import water into our service area, we're importing salt into our service area, and it's a huge concern. We've tried to mitigate that by using sources of imported water for groundwater replenishment based on state water project, which has the lowest 
uh, but that's still 680 pounds of salt. And moreover, we've seen increases in that as we've seen uh, the drought uh, sustained in uh, Northern California. So it's not only a quantity issue, but we have a quality issue that we're managing. So this shows the groundwater basins in our service area. So that, the dark blue is the outline of our service area. We have five major groundwater areas within our service area. We are forming two GSAs. Uh, in the service area, one that would recover all this area. Um, so basically the event groundwater basins that are listed below here, and then the other that would overlay an existing partial adjudication in that area. The primary groundwater production, and what I'm going to talk about a little bit more, is out of this basin, the Hemet San Jacinto Basin. It's the principal source of groundwater for four agencies in the region, as well as the Savoba tribe. It has the best quality of water uh, in the area. And as you get over, for example, into the Menifee basins, that water is not drinkable. Uh, it has very high levels of salt. And where we're focusing our desalting efforts is over in the, uh, this area. Uh, what's interesting is these areas are high priority basins uh, under Sigma. But the high priority in this area is salt contamination. Um, and in fact, we have such high groundwater in this area, we have a former air reserve, March Air Reserve base here, that it's within 10 feet of the surface. And that's because that water is not produced. It has a lot of natural recharge, it recharges that basin, but because of the quality of that water, uh, it is not produced. And in fact, what we're seeing is this very salty water migrating towards these higher quality basins. So part of the strategy is to prevent that migration extract and remove that salt and to replace it with low salt, uh, more reliable supplies of water. So our desalination program is consists of two brackish desalters. Uh, we do five to 6,000 acre feet of water from basically unusable groundwater. We are a part of a consortium called the Santa Ana River, River uh, uh, Watershed Project Authority. Uh, it's five agencies that have collaborated on many watershed planning and watershed scale initiatives, including our IRWM. But one of the things that we've done is build a brine line. So from our service area, there is a 70 mile brine line to the Pacific Ocean. So the desalters remove the salt from this highly salty groundwater. We put that water into the brine line and we're currently exporting about 27,000 tons of salt per year but there's 31,000 tons of salt coming in. So we're looking at a third desalter, which would get us up to about 50,000 tons a year of salt removal, where we're gonna actually be exporting salt from the service area and another 17,500 acre feet uh, of water supply. Our recycled water program, as I mentioned, started in the 1960s. We have four wastewater treatment plants. We treat uh, uh, 49 million gallons a day. If you go throughout our service area, uh, we work very closely with the land use agencies and our condition all developers to put in parallel plumbing. Um, so if you look at the parkways, the green wells, the sc uh, schoolyards, they're all irrigated with tertiary treated recycled water. Uh, we also have a large energy uh, facility on recycled water. Uh, they use about 4,000 acre feet of recycled water per year. And we have 10,800 acres of, uh, of agriculture under irrigation with the recycled water. That's required an investment of about $188 million in the last 10 years uh, in our area that has a very challenged economy that's been difficult, but our board has made that commitment and raised the rates to do that. And last year we served about 38,900 acre feet of recycled water. More importantly, from those four wastewater plants, there is zero discharge. Every bit of the wastewater that comes into those four plants is beneficially reused. And that has been a strategic objective of our organization, both now and in the future, and we just reached it in the last two years, but in the future of to have 100% utilization of that recycled water. Now, as development continues and agriculture, <coughs> agriculture goes down, where are we going to use that recycled water? Well, certainly we'll use it to support uh, irrigation needs for the developed areas. But the succession plan that we see is indirect potable reuse. And that's using this recycled water that's uh, tertiary treated, 
treating it further and using it for groundwater replenishment. So if you look at our surface area, we have growth, as I mentioned, and we have limited sources of supply. Our 2045 demands, based on the current gen uh, jurisdictional general plans, are about 68% higher than they are now. We've put together a long-term uh, master plan for water supply that identifies the specific sources of supply, primarily based on water use efficiency uh, and uh, brackish desalination and recycled water to serve those needs in the future. But our focus is really local water supply and water use efficiency and 100% recycling. So if you look at our potable reuse, indirect, uh, potable, indirect potable reuse objectives, really what are they? And first, kind of, let's be real clear on what indirect potable reuse is versus direct potable reuse. Indirect potable reuse is advanced treatment of tertiary water. So you have tertiary treated recycled water. It goes through subsequent steps of reverse osmosis, microfiltration, ultraviolet disinfection, and is then either put in a groundwater basin and percolated into a groundwater basin or put into a reservoir and blended it into a reservoir where in the groundwater basin it can undergo some soil aquifer treatment and in the reservoir it would have downstream treatment. So you have an, what they call an environmental buffer between the source of the uh, treated wastewater and the drinking water system. Direct potable reuse is from the plant, advanced treatment, and right into the distribution system. And by the way, there are places in this country that are currently doing that, Great Big Springs, Texas, uh, and it's done all over the world. But right now, the focus is indirect portable reuse, and there's huge potential for that. So our, objection, our objectives are, are uh, fivefold. First, <clears throat> to sustain and expand that Hemet San Jacinto Basin, that one yellow basin, where we see our primary uh, groundwater production through additional replenishment supplies. We want a reliable water supply that's going to be available year in and year out. It's going to modulate any variations in state water supply deliveries and also variations in stormwater. Uh, we have stormwater capture facilities in those groundwater basins where we do the recharge, but when you get four inches of rain one year, like we had last year, there's not much stormwater capture. So we also want to ensure a long-term succession plan for 100% utilization of recycled water. We want to meet all water quality requirements and lower the salt content, and then develop a multi-use groundwater recharge facilities. So what we came up with was this plan. This shows that yellow groundwater basin is right here. Uh, this is in the Hemet San Jacinto area. This is the current location of our wastewater treatment plant where we produce uh, tertiary treated recycled water. We will put in an advanced treatment plant in this area and we'll bring water into these groundwater basins from four sources. Uh, first, we will bring in the advanced treated water. We'll blend that with some tertiary water. That will go into the basin. In years when we can get state water project water, we will bring it in through this transmission line blended in here into the basin. And then also we have substantial <coughs> stormwater capture facilities that lead into those basins. Now, this is the San Jacinto River. And some of these blue areas are areas we've worked with the local jurisdictions to preserve because they are very high quality <coughs> groundwater recharge areas. This was talked about in one of the earlier panels and how important that is. And the jurisdictions have been worked with us very carefully to help preserve those areas for future store, uh, groundwater recharge. So the strategy is to use these four sources of supply to reach out to groundwater basin and really have the uh, recycled water optimized. This shows us. You're speaking my language. I have two more slides. Okay, this shows a schematic of that. Uh, again, this shows the treatment plant. We have the advanced treated water that's blended in. That's put in through the groundwater basin. We have stormwater capture and state water project that's used to dilute that and then soil aquifer treatment uh, that goes forward. Now, on the cost, people say, well, what about the cost for this technology? This is the cost for our imported water. This shows our groundwater, our desalinated uh, brackish water, very close to that, our purple pipe recycled water, and indirect potable reuse. Interestingly enough, if you look at the embedded energy in these water supplies, the desalinated groundwater is about half of the embedded energy that's in our imported water because of the pumping from Northern California. 
and the recycled water it, or the indirect potable leaves is about the same as the desalinated groundwater. So, there's, is there public support for indirect potable reuse? This is some polling that's been done by Water Reuse California. We've done similar polling in our service area and it almost matches this. And this is with very little background on indirect potable reuse. What it really shows is there is strong support. And as elected officials, I think you need to know that there is, with very little education, strong support. If you discuss the technologies, and how to best use this water, that support actually grows. And it's about two-thirds support and about one-third opposed. So there is public support. Unfortunately, there is not public support for indirect potable readers. Uh, the toilet to tap, uh, of course, this was a, a Santa Cruz. They had a, 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 a reused drinking water. Uh, yeah, I love this cartoon. The water director's first name was Rose, was Rosemary. She was called Rosemary Poopins. That's what we're doing today. But, so when you go forward with indirect water reuse projects, there obviously needs to be a very careful planning for those. And from a California statewide perspective, the potential is huge. Uh, there's currently being discharged 2. million acre feet of treated wastewater to the ocean. Uh, and that has a very substantial potential to meet the state water project and California water plant's uh, recycling goals in the future. And then this shows the projects of, in California. And right now, currently planned, uh, there's about 2.4, or about uh, IPR projects to serve about 2.4 million people in the state. So summary, and I'll wrap up, I apologize for that. For us, our indirect local reuse program is going to ensure a long-term succession plan uh, for our recycled water. We'll be able to sustain and expand the production in the basin. The costs are very competitive with other sources of supply. Uh, statewide, California discharges a tremendous amount of wastewater. It is an absolutely significant supply. And if you look at reusing all that water, it's enough water for about 8 billion Californians, or about a fifth of the state's needs. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity.